Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Derek, not Mark. Mark is right beside us here. And uh, if you want to talk to Mark later, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to do that. Um, if we've not yet met, my name is Derek Zacharias. I am one of the interns here at Grace Mormon. And uh, uh, I'm uh, pleased to be able to bring the word of God to us this morning. Have you ever heard the phrase, don't ask the question if you don't want to hear the answer? We've all been there. Let's just say it's your day off. Your to-do list is 100 items long, and while running errands, you run into somebody you haven't seen in a while. And without really thinking, you say, hey, great to see you. How's it going? Within moments of saying, how's it going, you realize the answer to your question is going to be a long one. No matter how much you'd like to, those words have left your lips, and you can't grab them back. 30 minutes go by, and there you stand, silently listening to the answer to your original question. You've gotten a lot more than you bargained for, and your to-do list is not getting any shorter. And that's one reason why we might sometimes say, don't ask the question if you don't want to hear the answer. In our text today, a rich young ruler is going to ask Jesus a question. And I'll let you decide for yourselves if you think that in hindsight, would he have asked that question if he knew the answer that Jesus was going to give? And so this morning, we're going to continue in our series in the Gospel of Luke. If you're a guest with us today, or if you are relatively new to Grace Warman, you should know that we systematically teach through books of the Bible. We go chapter by chapter and verse by verse so that we will be instructed by the entire Word of God. Today, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. So I'd invite you to open up your Bibles with me this morning to Luke chapter 18. If you're using a paper copy of the Bible, Luke can be found about three quarters of the way through. It's the third book of the New Testament. If you're using a Bible in app form, you can just use your menu or search function to locate Luke chapter 18 and verses 18 to 30. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, I believe there's some Bibles on the table uh, just behind the chairs at the back there. Feel free to take one, and that would be a gift from us to you. As we've been making our way through the Gospel of Luke, we have seen and heard Jesus teach with many parables. But here in today's passage, we're going to find the account of a face-to-face -face interaction between Jesus and a rich young ruler. We're going to listen to the passage, and I would ask that you follow along your Bibles or on the screen behind me, and after the passage is read aloud, we will pray. So let's have a listen. Reading from Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, would you help us this morning to know more about you, to love you more? Would you help us to see ourselves in light of who you are? And Father, would you help us to focus our eyes on Jesus? Father, would you do for us this morning what we can't do for ourselves? 
Would you open your word to us? Would you give us ears to hear that we might understand and apply the truth from your word to our lives day by day? We just commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. So this interaction between Jesus and the rich young ruler is also told in two other Gospels. We find parallel accounts of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19 and Mark chapter 10. Three of the four Gospel writers included this conversation in their text. The repetition of this interaction found in the three Gospels should signal to us that there's something here that we need to be reminded of, something we shouldn't forget. So there's two main characters in the first part of our passage today, Jesus and the young ruler. Now generally, I wouldn't want to give up the storyline too early, but we need to know that this story doesn't have a happy ending. In fact, it's probably a tragedy for the rich young ruler. And because it's a tragedy, hopefully we will have the wisdom to learn from his decisions and his wrong ways of thinking. So as we dig in together, let's take a brief look at the context of what's been happening. As far back as chapter 13 in Luke's Gospel, we find that Jesus, along with his disciples, are making their way towards Jerusalem. On their journey, they've been stopping in towns and villages as Jesus continues to reveal God's kingdom to his disciples and to the crowds that gather. And he's been doing this through his teaching and miraculous healings. Now, in this interaction, we actually don't know the name of the young ruler or the town where this conversation takes place. We're not told specifically the position of authority this young ruler had, but it wouldn't be a bad guess to suggest that he was a political or religious leader in his local community. We also aren't sure how much this young ruler knows about Jesus. Had he heard him preach before this day? Had he seen Jesus perform miracles? Given the context, we could guess that he had been listening to Jesus preach on at least this day, and perhaps he had heard, heard him at an earlier time as well. Have you ever noticed that when gospel writers share the same stories or accounts, the details aren't identical? The intent or meaning of the passages are parallel, but the details each author thought were important to include in their manuscripts differ. And that's okay. In fact, it's believed that it's the differences in these accounts of the stories and teachings of Jesus that give them credibility as authentic and not fabricated. And we actually find an example of this in today's opening verse, where Jesus and the rich young ruler meet. In Luke's account, verse 18 begins with, and a ruler asked him. In Matthew 19, we read the beginning of this account in which, with the rich young ruler as, and behold, a man came up to him saying, and in chapter 10 of Mark's gospel, we see a greater sense of urgency described when Mark writes, And as he, Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up, ran up and knelt before him and asked him. Now, personally, I like the way that Mark describes the scene. Jesus and the disciples are about to uh, continue on their journey towards Jerusalem. This rich young ruler has a question burning in his heart. And he seems to believe that Jesus is the one who can answer it. And so he rushes through the crowd that we heard about last week, parents bringing their infants to Jesus, and he kneels before Jesus. And so with that bit of context, let's look at all of verse 18. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As we see the entire verse, there are a couple of things worth considering. First off, the salutation used by the, the young ruler and then second, we need to look at the question he actually asks. There's been a lot of discussion on the greeting used by the ruler when he addresses Jesus as good teacher. This young ruler would have known that rabbis in the day were not called good rabbi or good teacher. Did he understand that God alone is good? That only God possesses inherent goodness and virtue? If he did understand this, then his greeting was appropriate, and he was actually equating Jesus with God himself. But I'm not sure that that was his intent. By addressing Jesus as good, I wonder if he's looking for a certain response back from Jesus. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I want you to think back. Some of you are going to have to think back a little further than others. But think back to a time, maybe in elementary or high school, could be even maybe be college or university. I want you to think about a time 
in your schooling, when let's say a quiz or exam was being handed back to the class, shortly after getting your graded exam, you get a tap on the shoulder from the person behind you, and you hear a whisper, hey, what mark did you get? More often than not, the person asking that question is really hoping that you're going to turn around and ask in return, what mark did they get? Probably in hopes that they're going to be able to brag a little bit about their success. What's really happening is the person who whispers that question about the grade received is actually looking at, to bring attention to themselves and have someone affirm them. That's kind of what I see going on here in verse 18. When the rich young ruler calls Jesus good teacher, don't you think he was kind of hoping that Jesus would reply, why do you call me good? You're a pretty good guy yourself. But no, that's not Jesus' reply. As he's done many times before, Jesus answers a question with a question. I think one of the reasons that Jesus does this is that he's less interested in the exchange of information and way more interested in the transformation of the person. His questions seem to pierce to the heart and drive at our motivations and desires. We read in verse 19, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. The rich young ruler doesn't rec seem to recognize Jesus for who he really is. He sees Jesus as a good teacher, one who has a certain level of authority, and one who even has great understanding of the laws and customs. What he hasn't seen yet, though, is Jesus as the promised Messiah, the one who came to fulfill the law that he holds to. He doesn't recognize Jesus as God's son in the flesh. And so with his lack of understanding at this point, I think it's with sincerity that the young ruler asks the question back in verse 18, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus would have known that this young guy was a leader, that he had been well-educated in the law and the prophets, and I think that this young ruler recognizes that in spite of his education, in spite of his training, eternal life is maybe not quite in his grasp. Something is missing. Because he asks, what must I do? He believed, like the majority of Jews in the day, that his actions, his ability to keep the law, would be the defining factor in his inheriting eternal life. And as much as he has tried to do this, something was still missing. Some act of kindness, some duty to fill, maybe a certain amount of generosity was the key to entering the kingdom. Like this rich young ruler, how often do we find ourselves thinking that our eternal standing is based on the merits of our credentials, our family heritage, or on the good works we do for others? And this very idea is what separates Christianity from every other religion. It is only for the Christian that eternal life is found in what God has done for us, as opposed to what we could possibly do for God. The young ruler is applying faulty logic as far as etern his eternal standing is considered. His assumption that he could do something in his own power to achieve eternal life is flawed. Similar to many current ways of thinking, this young ruler wanted to earn his way into heaven through his own goodness. The rich young ruler hasn't understood what Jesus has been preaching and teaching. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. The rich young ruler doesn't understand his need for mercy and grace. He doesn't see his need for a savior outside of himself. But Jesus does want him to see. He wants to pursue this young man's heart. Jesus wants the rich young ruler to see himself in the light and, and the reality that Jesus came to fulfill the very law he works so hard to obey. And so in verse 20, Jesus answers him, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And then we read in verse 21. And he, the young ruler, said, All these things I have kept from my youth. Look, Jesus, see how well I'm doing? I've followed these commands since I was old enough to understand them. Now, we might find it interesting that Jesus only shared five of the Ten Commandments with him. And what we might find even more interesting are the commandments that he didn't share. Jesus made no mention of idols 
or following other gods. Now, maybe we get the sense that Jesus is setting this young guy up a little bit. Not in a bad or manipulative way, but Jesus wants this young ruler to come to the place where he can see that following the law to perfection is actually impossible. And even if he tried his best, he'd fail. It wouldn't be enough to inherit eternal life on his own. Jesus knew everything about this young ruler, just like he knows everything about us. Jesus knew what made this young guy tick and that he would never be able to follow the commandments perfectly. Jesus wanted this young ruler to examine his desires and his motivations and come to realize that just maybe he wasn't as righteous as he believed himself to be. In a similar way, the Holy Spirit still does this for us today, through the Bible and through his work in our lives. When people come to faith in Jesus' crucifixion as the atoning sacrifice for their sins and his resurrection as the confirmation of power over sin and death, their position as a child of God is sealed. But it's amazing that even though God loves us as we are, he doesn't leave us that way. He's in the business of making us more like himself. That's what's known as sanctification. It's when we become more like Jesus. And part of the sanctification process is him working in our hearts, allowing us to evaluate and uncover our motives, seeing the different things that we might treasure more than him. And as we see it, he gives us the opportunity to purge anything that would hinder us from our obedience to Jesus. Let's jump back into the text at verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Now let's just pause here for a second. I can imagine as Jesus was talking, told him there was only one thing he was still missing, there might have been this little bit of excitement brewing in this rich young ruler's heart. Here he was, a young man with wealth and authority, probably used to getting his way or making his way. And Jesus says, it's just one thing that you're missing that's keeping you from inheriting eternal life. And then, if you're the rich young ruler, from your point of view, the tragedy of this story is about to hit home. Jesus says, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Jesus says, sell your stuff. Give the money to the poor. You will have unlimited wealth in heaven. And while you're still here on earth, come, follow me. What would your reaction be to this offer? What if it was you or I? Would we be excited that Jesus is offering us unhindered entrance into his kingdom? Do we believe that Jesus' kingdom is more valuable than the earthly things we so often strive for? We already know the rich young ruler's response. But let's look again in verse 23. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Now, don't we actually hope or expect that this rich young man is going to give it all up and follow Jesus? Because who would pass up on the opportunity to follow Jesus? To have eternal life? But when he hears the instruction and the invitation from Jesus, do you think he might be a little bit scared? Probably, because he loves his money. He loves his authority and his stuff, doesn't he? In both parallel accounts of this story found in Matthew and Mark, it's recorded that the rich young ruler went away full of sorrow. There he was, kneeling in front of Jesus, seeking the way to inherit eternal life. And Jesus reveals that he is the way. But Jesus' Jesus's offer forces the young ruler to decide, to choose what he valued most in the depths of his heart. And because the young ruler's earthly wealth was more important to him than an eternal treasure, he turned away from Jesus and decided to go his own way. Like, are you kidding me? Jesus just asked this rich young ruler to join his crew to be one of his followers. And with sadness, he walked away because he couldn't give up his wealth. He couldn't exchange the hope and promise 
of what he did not yet see, the self-enjoyment of material things for what he could see and treasure in this life. Now, before we're too quick to pass judgment on this young ruler, let's put ourselves in his shoes for just a minute. What do you think it meant in those days to be extremely rich? Did the rich have to go to the well and fetch their own water? I know I don't. I just turn on the tap. Did the rich have to walk long distances through snow and sleet? Or would they have had a servant or a chariot to take them to where they wanted to go? How many of us drove to church this morning? The rich would have had musicians and entertainers who would perform at the snap of their fingers. Not much different than me using my TV remote or telling my phone or computer to play my favorite song. The rich young ruler had experienced influence, affluence, and a certain level of comfort throughout his life. In much the same way, many of us experience those things today. The rich young ruler was wealthy, but not just in a financial sense. He was also morally wealthy, actually, as far as we can tell. He was a good person. And I think he was actually intrigued by Jesus and his invitation. He wasn't an enemy of Jesus, per se, in the sense that he was against what Jesus was doing, but his wealth. His wealth was the stumbling block that prevented him from being able to follow Jesus. His sin was that he had made an idol of his wealth. And that wealth and what it offered him was the God in his life that he placed ahead of Jesus. Now, one of the challenges that I face when I read the Bible, and specifically the gospel accounts of Jesus, is that I too often see myself as the protagonist in the stories as opposed to the antagonist. It's really easy for myself to see, or to see myself as Jesus in the text far more often than I see myself as the scribe, the Pharisee, the prostitute, or the rich young ruler. And so I need to admit, I probably have a lot more in common with this rich young ruler than I might be comfortable to admit. For him, his earthly wealth was his ultimate treasure. When asked to choose between Jesus or wealth, between God and mammon, he chose the money. Now, we've had some great teaching on money over the last number of months. Kurt's explanation of the parable of the dishonest manager taught us that our earthly wealth should be used to bring others to the kingdom. We have been warned that we are to be the masters of our money and not let our pursuit of money master us. We cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, mammon refers to possessions like money or property. Jesus describes mammon as a burdensome ruler, offering false promises and security and happiness. Jesus depicts mammon as a superhuman power that actually competes with God and deceives people. But Jesus also believes it can be used to care for others and to build relationships. That is true wealth. As we study this interaction between Jesus and the rich young ruler, we need to understand that Jesus' instructions for him to sell all of his possessions and to give, the poor, give to the poor were descriptive specifically for him in this case. And it's not a principle to live by for all followers of Jesus. And so let's be clear about this. The act of selling his possessions was not what would have saved him. For we are all saved by faith alone. Jesus called him to sell everything he had, I think, as a way to illuminate what he treasured most. And so as we look back into our scripture, the rich young ruler has sorrowfully walked away from Jesus. He has forfeited an eternal treasure for his earthly wealth. And it appears that Jesus is now speaking to his disciples and to the crowd that have witnessed this scene with the rich young ruler as we read in verses 24 and 25. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus creates this mental picture for us using camels and needles. So some people have offered other explanations for what the eye of the needle is, 
But I think the only way to understand this passage is to take Jesus' words literally. I think we can base this decision on the response of the disciples to Jesus' word picture. Now, we know that it's physically impossible. Big camel, small eye of a needle. There is no way that camel's getting through an eye of a needle. And yet, Jesus says it would be easier for that to happen than for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. So where is the hope for us in that? Well, let's keep reading. When we read this account in Matthew or Mark, it says that the disciples were astonished or exceedingly astonished at Jesus' words. In Luke's account, verse 26 states, those who heard it said, then who can be saved? Now let's look at the big picture of this story from the disciples' perspective. They saw this young, wealthy ruler come to Jesus seeking the way to inherit eternal life. They probably saw in this young ruler so many qualities that they didn't actually see in themselves. He had affluence. He had influence. He appeared to be pure and righteous as he had kept the law since he was a child. The disciples, what were they? Working class guys? Thought less of because of where they were from? And they were aware of their sins and shortcomings. But this young ruler, with all that he brought to the table, wouldn't it have been great to have someone in his position join their group? And so the disciples respond, if not this guy, Jesus, then who can be saved? What were the disciples missing here that Jesus could see? Jesus saw that the young ruler put his trust for his security and his happiness in his wealth. The young ruler wanted to know what he could do to earn his way into the kingdom of God. He was depending on his own righteousness and his keeping of the law to be the gateway to the kingdom. And when it really came down to it, the treasure of his heart wasn't Jesus. His earthly possessions and position had become the idol in his life and the treasure of his heart. And despite Jesus' invitation to know him and follow him, the young ruler rejected Jesus. It's actually pretty heavy stuff. And the tragedy here is that not everyone who hears the invitation from Jesus will follow him and accept it. There are going to be people who will walk away. So where in this passage is good news? The good news for us is that no one is saved on the basis of their wealth, education, or merit. It's not even on the basis of how much we might give to charity or to the church. We can't earn it. And that is good news. The good news for us is that no one is saved on the basis of their wealth. Jesus levels the playing field for everyone. No amount of wealth, no position or job title, no amount of schooling or intelligence, or no matter how, tra- how good you try to be, none of it will earn your way into God's kingdom. And in fact, our affection for money our affection for influence or power can actually make it more difficult for us to submit to Jesus. And so how does Jesus answer the question about then who can be saved? In verse 27 we read, But he said, What is impossible with men is possible with God. Again, here is our good news. Just as it's impossible for that camel to go through an eye of a needle, it's impossible for anyone, rich, middle class, poor, to be saved on their own accord. But God, he takes what's impossible for any of us and makes the way. In Romans chapter 5, we read, But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love for us. He showed how much he treasured us by allowing Jesus to endure a death on a cross a death that we deserved because only Jesus could take on the wrath of God and defeat the power of sin, Satan, and hell. It's because of what Jesus did that we can share in the inheritance that only he deserves. That is mercy and that is grace. Are there earthly treasures that you value more than Jesus? For the rich young ruler, it was his wealth. That's what prevented him from being able to accept Jesus' invitation to follow him. Are there things in our lives, our money, our time, 
Maybe it's our family and friends. How about our level of comfort? Are there things that we hold on to so tightly that when Jesus offers us his hand to follow him, we have to make a choice? If we open our hands to Jesus' invitation to follow him, we risk losing those things that we're holding on to. This mindset of self-sufficiency is such a contrast to what Jesus taught earlier in this very chapter. In the passage we went through last week, in verses 16 and 17, Jesus says, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child, shall not enter it. Jesus says that to receive the kingdom, we must come with the nature of a small child or infant. We must come in a helpless state, in complete need of someone else to provide for our safety and nourishment. Think about an infant for a second. When they're hungry, when they're cold, what do they do? They cry out for the one who can feed them and protect them. What a contrast to this rich young ruler. He came to Jesus with an attitude of self-sufficiency, with a sense that he possessed the resources to be the master of his own destiny. I think we need to try and flip this mindset. What if we saw ourselves as managers instead of masters? As managers of God's possessions? That means the wealth we earn, the time we spend, the influence we have, would actually not be ours, but would belong to God. And as managers of God's possessions, we would use them in a way that would increase his kingdom and not our own. Jesus says we will not lose the things that we are tempted to cling to, but rather, when Jesus is our treasure, he will multiply the treasures of our hearts. And I think that's what's being alluded to in our last verses, verses 28 through 30. And Peter said, See, we've left our homes and followed you. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brother or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. So after all this, Peter calls out that he and the disciples have left their homes and their families to follow Jesus. Peter has just heard Jesus' words and invitation to the rich young ruler, and he watched as that young man rejected Jesus and walked away in order to keep almost everything that these disciples have forfeited to follow Jesus. Now, I think the question is probably on the tip of Peter's tongue. Is it worth it, Jesus? But before that question could potentially even be spoken, Jesus answers. And not only for the disciples, but for all followers, followers of Jesus who may ask, is it worth it? The answer is a resounding yes, it is worth it. Jesus tells us that whatever we give up for the sake of the kingdom, it will be multiplied in this time and in eternity. Now, something to consider. Remembrance Day is tomorrow. I know we have at least a couple of Americans in the audience. For American friends, tomorrow's Veterans Day. In either case, it's a day that we set aside to remember. To remember the sacrifices of those who gave their lives so that we can enjoy the life and freedoms we experience today. And it's important to remember, lest we forget. As much as, as, much as all of those who gave up everything for our freedoms and for our peace, Jesus gave up even more. So is it worth it to follow Jesus? Jesus gave up everything so that when we put our faith in him, we find our perfect hope, our ultimate freedom, and our eternal peace. These are treasures that our money will never be able to buy. Sometimes we need regular reminders, like a Remembrance Day, so that we don't forget. It's one of the reasons that we gather here on a weekly basis as a church. It's so that we can remind each other to love and treasure Jesus above all else to love the people around us selflessly, and to use our resources to help others love Jesus too. And so today, let's not forget. Let's remember this rich young ruler. But let's remember to hold on to this thing, the things of this world with open hands 
so that we can cling tightly to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that even though sometimes it might be a challenge or, or come with some difficulty, it actually does illuminate the desires, the intentions of our hearts. Father, we desire to be in right alignment with you today. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would show us areas of our lives where we need to submit, where we need to open our hands and let go of some things so that we can cling to Jesus. He is our hope. He is our freedom. He is our peace. Thank you, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.